Ooh, <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, welcome to Nitro Nights. I'm your host, Indiana Black. Uh, sorry, I was just trying to qualify for world's fastest gamer via Gear Club, but no worries because while I'm getting some assistance with that, we'll also be helping you guys later out in the show figure that one out. So stay tuned and buckle up. What up, team? It's episode 11, another Wednesday night, which means it's just in time for Nitro Nights. I'm still your host, Indiana Frost and Black, and we're doing things a little bit different this time around. Tom Deacon's still joining us, but much later on in the show as we break down all of the hottest racing news, including a very special look at some of the iRacing track scanning capabilities. But first, one thing at a time. This weekend was the VCO Cup of Nations, and we've got all the breakdown for you. Esports racing teams from all over the world came together to represent their home countries in the VCO Cup of Nations. They weren't just racing for glory though, but also for a good cause. The main goal of the event was to raise funds for UNICEF. The group stage started off with 16 teams, but over the course of the weekend, only six of them made it through to the final. Germany, France, Italy, Great Britain, Spain and Chile the final was dominated by European countries. But the races weren't just your everyday races. Each race featured different cars and a different kind of competition. And not everyone was used to this much variety. And they launch away. Charlie Summers gets a good launch at the front of your field to the first corner. Chile up in the wall. They get contact oh. with Italy. Two cars off at the back there. Absolute nightmare for me. He's Nugolotti. Another Italian car has gone round. That's Constantini has had drama on this opening lap before the jump. So Italy having an absolute nightmare. Two drivers to the back of the field here. Right up until the end, the final was neck and neck between Germany and France. Anything was still possible, even in the very last race. The points were close, and even though Max Benecker managed to get first place for Germany in the last race, it didn't look great for the rest of the team. They'd also have to place well to put Germany in pole position. It all came down to the wire. Oh, Wobber! Yeah, he's dropping down! This could cost it's Germany more. the championship! This is unbelievable stuff! We'll keep an eye on this one because Wolmeyer is struggling to make it to the end of this one. There goes Charlie Summers past him now. He's struggling to get that car back to the finish, but Fenelosa has spun! That's helped Wolmeyer here to gain a position back in this one! Sensational end! In the end, only six points separated Germany and France, as the rest of the German team did well enough to secure first place. France came in a close second, with Italy coming in a pretty distant third. The VCO Cup of Nations was both fun and a bit different. All in all, a great way to support a good cause. And of course, a huge congratulations to Germany there on taking the VCO Cup of Nations. Now that said, our very special guest is going to be Chris Hay, uh, influencer, podcaster, YouTuber, content creator. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, when I was listening to your content and kind of trying to put my feet into the whole sim racing or esports racing, whatever you want to call it, world, you were actually one of the first names that I came across and I just digested a ton of your content before even realizing that I was going to get a chance to sit down with you. And I almost felt that you were... Uh, like a sim racing historian is what it, it kind of felt like. <laughs> I think I've just been kicking around for uh, for quite a while, uh, one way or another. First of all, thanks for having me on the show, guys. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. No, uh, it's entirely our pleasure. So can you kind of walk me through how you you got into the space that you are? Because we've had uh, guys like TRL Limitless on before who do content creation, but yours sits in a really unique setting where it's very well polished. It's very clear that you have a media background. The editing is superb, the sound audio, everything like that. And it's so informative. You just came out with a uh, massive breakdown of AC's DLC of the GT3 series and you go car by car by car. I think you said something like three hours worth of content and it's all just so beautiful. Well, yeah, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, you're right. I do have a, a bit of a media background. My sort of background in sim racing is uh, I was first introduced to the concept in, in the early 90s by my dad, who bought the first Jeff Cram and Grand Prix game. He's a massive Formula One fan at the time, at the height of Mansell Mania. And 
when a game comes out for the PC, which was a, a growing thing at the time that allows you to drive as Nigel Mansell, of course he was going to buy it. And of course, <laughs> seven-year-old me was going to do everything I could to drive it as well. And I, I've sort of driven everything since, really. But getting into content creation, uh, it was uh, two or three years ago, I decided to start a YouTube channel just uh, for fun. Uh, I think there was a mod for Assetto Corsa that I thought was really good and I hadn't seen anyone talking about and the the usual suspects like like Jimmy Broadbent hadn't picked up on this or they hadn't done a video on it at the time anyway and I thought well let's give it a go and because I do have a bit of a, a production background you know I started out doing uh, live uh, audio at, at sort of concerts and things like that and I've worked in graphic design so it's all sort of building on skills I already had and it's yeah it's sort of gone from there really. What's uh, interesting to me is you you've kind of seen the shift from uh, gaming into sim racing and now sim racing into esports effectively um, as now this language has has turned over and kind of the events are changing themselves uh, how has the community changed? Because I know a couple of weeks ago on your channel, you were having a discussion about how it was still such a niche community, sim racing in general. Do you think that that is going to stay the same now that the vocab has changed and obviously with the COVID situation pumping so many more eyes on this? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Picking up on the terminology changes is, is, is actually a really nice way to sort of delineate it. Uh, to start with, I didn't know the term sim racing, and I hadn't heard it until I sort of came. I took a little bit of a break uh, five or six years ago, maybe a little longer, and took a three or four year break and came back and everyone was calling it sim racing. <laughs> uh, before that, it was just driving games or, or gaming. Uh, and perhaps uh, I'm getting the timelines a little bit confused there uh, because uh, life is uh, coming at long. you fast. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think that that shift was a big one because it symbolized a sort of professionalization of the the titles. They went from being quite DIY homebrew things, maybe made by a very small team of developers, or if you were lucky, a really big team of developers who happened to have a passion for motorsport, to some of these software houses like iRacing and Kunos and, and SMS and all those guys who were deeply, deeply focused on creating hardcore sims. And then, of course, in the last few years, uh, the idea of gaming as well as not more than just a pastime as a as a business has taken off massively and we have esports we have racing esports and we're in a situation now where that's supporting a lot of people's livelihoods including you know yours and mine as we speak now which when i came back into the hobby four or five years ago whenever it was uh it just seemed a completely alien concept but to speak to the the question about how communities have shifted and reacted to that yeah what i said about it being quite a niche community is i think in context of what i was trying to say is if you compare the number of players to a title like iRacing, which is probably the biggest sim racing title in terms of raw numbers to call of duty mm -hmm. they, they don't even compare so we're still we're still quite small fry doing very complex things and getting involved with some massive global manufacturers now uh, and uh, other companies pumping money into the sport so it's a it's a complicated time for the sim racing world where it tries to be this diy hobbyist production type thing this diy hobbyist group of people getting together forming small communities and doing amazing things. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got massive global automotive manufacturers running eSport events. And during COVID, as you said, yeah. real-world motorsport events coming to, to us to, to play in our sandpit. So busy. It's been busy for the community, I think. That was me. <laughs> I love the terminology of uh, DIY. Um, before this, we were talking about my, my uncle, and I remember watching him play these driving games at the time. And he'd have like his joystick duct taped to the the table. He had like his uh, pump up office chair, and he had c all these contraptions attached to it. And now, you know, there's such specific gear that you can go out and buy. You can have a super over the top rig if you'd like, or you can have like a more of a Logitech. I know one of your most popular videos. You you go into kind of like the entry point gear. Um, and I think that was, A, how I first found you. I was like, how do these, how do these people even set up uh, to, to race in these games? Yeah, it's interesting, the, uh, the sort of dichotomy, because there's people who get really deep into the hobby and they spend a lot of money. And I, I am very much guilty of that. 
I can put, I can put some of that on the fact that I'm sort of doing this professionally now, and having good gear course, is yes. is more robust and can rely on it more. But really, it is boys and their toys. I, I think that's that's a probably fair way of describing at least my uh, the way I interface with those products. But Honestly, uh, and I've said this at every possible opportunity, if you buy a Logitech G29 or a Thrustmaster T300 or whatever other entry-level wheel, you are 90% of the way there at the absolute worst. And a lot of people find that when they upgrade to much better gear, they don't actually go any quicker. They might be able to be more consistent because uh, it's more repeatable. The manufacturing tolerances of the equipment's better. It's more reliable. It's more repeatable. Uh, I would say having a rig is better than having an office chair because you're sat in exactly the same position every time you hit the brake pedal. So it's a more repeatable process. But there are guys setting world record times on Sims that have got a 15-year-old Logitech wheel, maybe a 10-year-old Logitech wheel. There's me going off again, just making up timescales. But a 10-year-old Logitech G25 that's on its last legs and they're still setting world record times and honestly beating me with my much, much better rig. So you're saying I have no excuses then. It's just me being <laughs> slow. No, it's okay. It's fine. Um, we have to move on to our quick fire round. I think I briefed you a little bit how it's going to go. Is I'm just going to ask you questions. And just as fast as you can, Chris, just off the top of your head, tell me what you want. Um, so favorite racing game? Ever. That would probably be pro- the first Project Gotham. Okay. Favorite driver? Real driver? Uh, I was a huge Senna fan. Jamming on that clutch. Favorite car? Uh, Jaguar XJR14. Okay. And what's more important? uh, The wheel or the pedal? Uh, In sim racing, the pedals. And GT3 or GT4 cars? Oh, that's unfair. Uh, GT4 at the moment. Okay. (laughs) And uh, what class do you feel is still missing in sim racing? Oh, uh, I need Group C, uh, 1980s and early 90s. Uh, Le Mans era sports cars are massively underrepresented for how much I desperately want them. <laughs> there we go. Uh, historian there again. So, uh, guys, we're going to be right back with Chris. Thank you so much for the quick fire round. He has survived. But have you guys ever wondered what makes iRacing so realistic and the technology behind it? Well, we've got the video just for you. It was especially NASCAR fans who roared with excitement when iRacing implemented the history laden North Wilkesboro Speedway a few weeks back. It was just the newest of many racetracks which have been recreated to perfectly replicate their real-world counterparts down to the finest detail. To achieve this, iRacing's developers laser scan every last inch of the track's racing area. When laser scanning, the laser sends out a beam and it sends back a reflective property for each uh, each surface type on the, on the racetrack. So um, a painted line is going to have a higher reflective property, so it's going to show up as a brighter color, where an asphalt or a darker material is going to have a darker or a reddish tint to it. It's not hard to imagine that this process takes an age. Five years ago, the time required was halved with the release of a new scanner, which can scan in both directions at once. This also gives detailed information about braking zones, bumpers, and much more, at least as long as it doesn't rain and wash the rubber on the asphalt away. After scanning, developers take the data and import it into a software called Sandbox to model the properties of the track. They can easily measure out the geometry and automatically put textures on the scan, like a skin. To reach iRacing's typical level of detail, developers don't stop at the curbs. Every object next to the asphalt and grass is also correctly modeled. GPS checkpoints assure correct positioning and a catalog of photos serve as blueprints for the models and textures of buildings and other objects. Lots of test drives are needed until even the tiniest pothole and the last window of a building are in the right place. But in the end, the experience on the track and the fans' excitement will be well worth it. Chris, I feel like we were we were just kind of talking about the DIY and like the handcrafted nature there. And then we have a video like that and it shows the guy and he's like putting the texture on the track. And I'm like, that's the same dude. That's the same dude that went and started painting the airplane. And now he's basically painting this, this laser uh, scan track and this whole idea of you know, with time and technology that driving games became sim racing now become esports. And it, it kind of feels like a perfect circle there. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. They very much are the same sort of people because 
uh, the peak guys at iRacing, like all of the developers, have, have gotten into this through a love of motorsport and sim racing rather than necessarily just being a, a, a game developer. Uh, in most cases, uh, for all the people that I've met, at the very least. But speaking of DIY, uh, there are people now DIYing laser scanning of racetracks. They're going out, they're buying commercially available data sets uh, of laser scans or even commissioning them themselves to produce mods for other games that don't necessarily have that content to start with. So there is even a DIY element <laughs> to the high-tech side of things now because... There are some very, very talented people in this community, that's for sure. Do you have a, a preference on if you prefer the laser uh, tracks versus the handcrafted tracks? I mean, it can be difficult to tell. A very well-made handcrafted track will be difficult to tell the difference from unless you're very, unless you know the the track itself intimately. Uh, the small details, uh, you know, the small bumps, the tiny bits of change in the road surface, uh, the curb details and stuff that are quite difficult to get without hard data uh, can be quite difficult to replicate in the handmade stuff. And you can you can see in all of iRacing's circuits that it has all of that detail. And because you know it's backed up by hard data that you know it's right. Whereas with a handcrafted track, you kind of have to take a little bit of a leap of faith. And some, uh, and I'm not the biggest expert on this by far, some are very close in the handcrafted world and others are woefully inadequate. <laughs> I know that um, you've done some comparisons on tracks, real life tracks versus in simulation tracks. Uh, do you mind sharing some of your results or kind of how you felt about it? <laughs> Well, I think, uh, I mean, the main one uh, that I've, uh, you know, driven in the real world and, and in Sims extensively is the Nordschleife. Uh, and the point of comparison there is that no matter how good the data is, and I've driven the laser scanned iRacing version and the laser scanned Assetto Corsa version and the laser scanned R Factor 2 version. So I've got three different points of comparison from different. <laughs> times over the last five or six years whenever those scans were commissioned and three different interpretations by uh, the developers nothing prepares you for the elevation the camber the bumps they're all there in the sims you know intellectually or, or in your brain it tells you they're there but when you're going up a hill that feels like a wall to a blind crest uh, and you can't see the turn ahead of you in, in real life that is a completely different experience than it is in a racing sim I feel like the conversation when we talk about the future of sim racing or esports racing is, uh, you know, lots of people are talking about VR and, you know, maybe even wearing like a VR helmet so you can even start to look around a turn or look through it. Um, but now, it, it, to me, it feels like almost the, the technology or the future of it is in how we're scanning the tracks, how we're getting closer and closer to uh, making the cars feel or getting the feedback. What would you say is kind of like the next, the next point? Is it the VR, so you're in a totally immersive experience? Is it feedback in the rig that you're driving so you can feel you know, as close to like the G-forces as possible? Or is it getting as precise as possible on the tracks? Well, I think it's a little bit of everything. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have 100% said VR is going to be the total future of this. But we've seen kind of uh, there's been an element where it hasn't taken off in the mainstream quite as quickly as uh, maybe sim racers would have liked, which mm. means we're not getting quite the level of development from as many manufacturers. So uh, the progress is a little bit slower in VR. There's some big technologies in VR that haven't really made it onto consumer headsets yet either. So while I think VR will continue, it's not really been that um, that sort of golden ticket that I thought it may have been. As for motion, that's another area that, again, it's a very DIY and small manufacturer-based thing. And motion can be a bit disappointing. Unless it's very, very well set up and very well configured, it can be quite disorienting. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of motion rigs and, and gimmicks in general. So technologically... To give a really disappointing answer, uh, I don't think there's a very obvious, this is what's going to get better next. There is no disappointing answer. Now, while that is all looking towards the future of what potentially and possibly is to come for some racing, we're going to actually go ahead and look at the past. That means we've got our newsflash with Tom Ge Deacon to run us through all of the hottest racing news. 
Ah, oh, you're too kind, Indiana. Thank you so much. Yes, it's me, Tom Deacon, back for the Nitro Nights News Flash. Lots to get into, so let's waste no more time. We'll start with the iRacing W Series Round 7 in Suzuka. Now, we know there's one name to talk about, and that's Baitska Visser, and she got off to a flying start in Japan by finishing on pole position in qualifying. However, that was the highest position she finished throughout the day. Another name that is fast becoming well-known is Marta Garcia. She had the better day of the two drivers and finished first twice, once in the first race and once in the third race. Uh, here's the interesting thing that was in the race one, a battle back and forth, a proper ding dong between the two of them and Marta Garcia got the better of that race. In the reverse grid, Spaniard Belen Garcia, who turns out isn't related to Marta Garcia. I know, who knew? But don't worry, guys, I've looked into it for you. Uh, she won the second race. That's Belen Garcia. Marta, on the other hand, because it's a reverse grid, started in P19. However, went all the way up to P4. Epic stuff from her. Uh, as for Baitskavissa, in race three, she finished fourth due to damage to her car. What does that do for the standings? Well, Vissa is still on top by 49 points. Next up is Mount Panorama in Australia. Looking forward to that. Uh, let's stay in Japan for the second as we head over to Formula Sim Racing. This is race 9 out of 10, also taking place on the Suzuka track, and it's the penultimate one. Now, before this race, uh, Jernai Simoncic led the competition with 134 points, and in second place was Petter Berlek uh, with 123 points. That's 11 points separating these two drivers. Don't forget, 25 points if you win the race, which means this championship is very much still alive. Who is going to win it? However, a technical failure in lap 45 of 53, unfortunately, decided the championship. Berlek uh, will disconnect, as you could very much see that, as his both uh, front two wheels spun straight to the left. Um, and the damage that was caused meant that he had to retire from the race. Simicic won the race and with that win has won the title before we even get to round 10 of 10. Congratulations to Simicic. Uh, now, uh, in the news flash, I think it would be rude not to. And it's always good to talk about new titles that are dropping imminently. We'll kickstart with Forza, which was officially announced. Um, there's no number yet. Could it be Forza 8? Maybe uh, there's no number and this is a complete reboot. Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to wait and see what happens. The trailer doesn't show too much. However, it has got everyone talking. And also, there is new footage for Dirt 5 gameplay. Uh, there's a new mode called Pathfinder and, people say, the most hardcore off-road terrain in the whole Dirt series. Not my words, their words, but I tell you what, it sounds epic and I am looking forward to tucking into that, as I'm sure you are as well. Now, um, here's a little thought for you. Imagine you took 12 of the biggest esports teams and put them all together to form the Esports Racing Team Association. Well, think no more, it has actually happened. The likes of G2 Esports, Team Redline and William Esports have got on board to improve the structure in the sim racing scene. Plus, they also want to lend teams a bigger voice. Now, Stephen English of Williams Esports said this, and I quote, It's only by working together towards a common goal that we can drive the growth in racing sims to sit alongside all the top titles in the esports landscape. Exciting time, guys. Very exciting. Uh, for more on that story, head across to Twitter to at overtake underscore GG. And finally, in the news flash, if you want to follow in the footsteps of James Baldwin and be the world's fastest gamer, then you know what? You can, because it's time to get involved for season four. You can qualify for next season's event via a free-to-play mobile race game, Gear.club. This is a repeat of season three's qualifier. Best of luck if you are entering into that. Oh, hang on. Just downloaded. Absolutely amazing. Right, I know what I'm up to. That is the end of the news flash. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Indiana, it's back to you in the studio. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, I've been trying to win on Gear Club all day, and I'm absolute garbage at it. Uh, that said, we are still here with Chris. And Chris, I know we just got a look at uh, Forza, at Dirt. Um, you've talked about how you used to play driving games. That's how I kind of feel about Forza and Dirt. I know that they've got like special names. There's like arcade racers, sim racers. Uh, I feel like those games are, are driving games. Do you play them? 
Oh, uh, all the time. I, it can be very problematic trying to pigeonhole titles like this. And I think the end of sim racing that I end up in a lot of the time, the the nerdy guys play a, a, see, uh, dealing with suspension settings in R Factor 2 of an evening can quite <laughs> often be into being a little bit elitist. And it's some of the terminology, simcade, arcade, uh, hardcore sims, things like that get thrown around and it can come across as a bit elitist. But I am a long-term Forza fan. I've been playing the franchise since the first Xbox. Um, I'm a big Gran Turismo fan. I'm a big fan of the Dirt series. So, uh, in fact, the Dirt series, uh, the Dirt Rally games have been uh, a big part of it, and uh, number five is uh, something I'm also looking forward to. So, yeah, I don't... I think I try and play anything that's got wheels on it, really. And well, not wheels. Wipeout. Whatever happened to that? <laughs> I know, right? I used to, oh, that one actually just brought me back. I just feel like I got hit with nostalgia. Ooh, okay. That was wild. Anyway, uh, we're now going to take a trip over into our social showroom. Reminder, guys, that you can tweet at us at NitroNights. Use the hashtag NitroNights, and then hopefully you can show up on the social showroom. Now, we asked some questions, Chris, and this is what you're going to see. We asked people to send in a GIF to showcase their latest race, and... I'm going to say that any time a turtle is involved, they probably didn't do too well in their last race. Slow and steady. Slow uh, and I, steady. Hopefully, he's talking about like his consistency. He was always there, constantly making the right turns. Okay, the let's. Tortoise and the hare. You know, there's a fable there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone, any, has any winner ever been described as tortoise and the hare and then has won. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> okay. What's our What's our next one? Is it faster? Okay. <laughs> I'll take the turtle. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay. I'll get in if, trouble if I talk about that. Probably. <laughs> I've had those moments. We call them the, the heated gamer moments where you're just like, God! <laughs> I call them term one. <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like when I try to take turn one, especially... <laughs> My first uh, run at sim racing or esports racing, I was like, I don't even know how they manage this. I try to get around the first turn, and I just send it right into the wall. Why can't we have a damage model like that? That was uh, that was something. <laughs> okay, uh, what what do we have next? I believe it's the ERTA. Oh no, we have one more. Oh no. <laughs> Mm. See that takes on a whole different context when you, you when when you've been there and, and driven around it. It's it's scary how close those barriers really are. See, he's not actually driving. I'm glad a, I didn't do it. He's not actually driving a car. He's actually driving a lawnmower, and uh, <laughs> then he's actually doing well on the grass. Okay, now I think we have our next one from the ERTA, um, and we talked about this a little bit in the interview as well as Tom brought it up on. Um, Newsflash, this idea of creating an association to try to help build structure for a very budding industry. Yeah, I think this is super important. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of uh, esports drivers over the last couple of years in my involvement in the commentary side of things and in event production, and they all have common complaints, but there's been no common voice mm. to air these complaints, especially when you consider the sort of dichotomy between maybe not a Williams eSports, but a smaller sim racing team that's doing really well, punching above their weight. There's just two or three guys maybe working together. How can they really lobby uh, their interests against uh, a global uh, motoring manufacturer or a large production company that has decades of experience. There's such a, a disparity of experience and leverage and power there that it, it's made it quite difficult for some of these guys to really get their thoughts about how their side of the esports business should be run and promoted across. So I am very happy to see this uh, come to fruition and uh, I'm, I'm friends with a couple of the people that have been instrumental in making this happen. So it's it's great to see it finally come to fruition. I mean, it, it's a it's a partnership. I know I come from an esports background, and you talk about you know disparity of power, and it's huge where the the players really don't have a voice, they don't have an advocate. So for it to happen this early on, I think in sim racing's uh, career is quite important. Now. Um, 
we kind of move over into our social showroom about talking about some of the community. You know, now that the community is building up um, this player association, we now have uh, drivers like this, where it's all about the the sportsmanship of the driving. And this is what I found really interesting coming into um, sim racing and esports racing. I've seen clips of guys who a car runs out of gas, and so an opponent will get behind them and help push them into the pit stop. We now have uh, speeches like this where a racer feels that I think he sh he forced someone into the tire wall and then felt that that was a dirty move and so hit the gas and let the competitor take the position back from him as like a, a gentleman racer style. Well, that's something that happens in, in club races. There are often rules that say, if you feel you're at fault in an accident, let the other guy pass. It's sort of the least you can do, uh, a sort of golden rule, if you will. But it's interesting, uh, Jadier is the epitome of sportsmanship except for the one time when he was lapping me that he intentionally put me in the wall which i won't let him forget about anytime soon <laughs> but, no he is uh the epitome of sportsmanship and a great ambassador uh for the sport just because of his enthusiasm which i don't know honestly don't know how he can be that enthusiastic <laughs> for seven eight twelve twenty four hours in a go it's uh something else some people like really need their morning coffee to wake up and he's like racing for 24 hours and he's just like a wholesome, lovely guy the entire time through. And I feel like that's now we have, um, you know, the Players Association and then we have sportsmanship racing and then to like really get like the full encompass of everything that is esports and sim racing, we now have to show TRL Limitless. Uh, he was driving F1 and he drifts with the car. <laughs> And I think he gets some assistance with the dude on the outside bouncing off of his tires a little bit here. That's pretty Yeah, that's, uh, that's a slip angle there, isn't it? That's, uh, <laughs> uh, tough to do in a high aero car. So, uh, you know, hats off to uh, hats off to him. I mean, what would you what would you do if you saw if you were the commentator, which I don't know, maybe you actually could have been there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What would you do if you, you saw that? Like, is that just where a, we call it a pop off moment in League of Legends? Would you just like pop off to see someone do that? I think uh, a, a hushed reverence for for something you don't see very often might be more appropriate. I think, uh, particularly in motorsport commentary, it, it can be very easy to get excited, very overexcitable. So I think that would leave me speechless, that one. Amazing. Okay, perfect. Chris, it has been so lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking to us. You were always so eloquent. Do you have any kind of like final last words or goodbyes, any sort of plugs that you want to put on? Um, no, just to say uh, best of luck uh, with this endeavor, you guys, because uh, what you're pulling together here is an extremely slick, uh, beautiful production. I, I love what you guys are doing. Uh, I said before we started this recording how great it is to see this level of professionalism in sim racing broadcasting. Uh, it's making everyone have to take note and, and up their game, and that can only be a good thing. As for plugs, um, I think you find me around the internet. Uh, I'm pretty much just Chris Hay everywhere. No S on the end. That guy is a reporter for MSNBC in the US, if you put an S on the end. So unless you want to know about what's going on in US politics at the moment, probably leave the S off. I wonder how many times he has people tweeting at him about sim racing and he's just like, "I please stop. <laughs> anyway, guys, <laughs> that's it for Chris. That's it for me. And that's it for us. Uh, be sure to tune in every single Wednesday night for Nitro Nights and we'll be sure to cover all of the hottest esports racing news. Until then, buckle up and stay safe, guys. <laughs> <laughs>